that the highest king would welcome me I was lost but he brought me in Oh his love for me Oh his love for me Who the sun sets free Who is free Good morning. If you will, turn with me to 1 John 4.19. 1 John 4.19. And I'm excited this morning. Excited to be here. I'm excited to see Evan, Georgiana, and Everly. It's been a been a sweet morning. I've been missing them. First John four nineteen. If you will stand with me. We love because he has first loved us. Let's pray. Father, I love you. I thank you and I praise you for your good. And I am so not. Pray that you forgive me, Father. I'm a sinner. Take me out of your way this morning and use me as you will. Fill our hearts this morning with your truth. 
and change us by them. I pray that you'd bless Heaven and Georgiana and Everly as they go back to Birmingham. I pray, Father, that your hand would be upon them and that you would bless them in the perfect way that you know how. In the name of Jesus Christ, my Savior, my Lord, and my King, I pray it. Amen. So, <clears throat> last week, Willie got up and had something on his heart. A guy that here locally had taken his own life the other day. And I, God had given me this, this title weeks before. I'd been praying about what I needed to do. And when Willie got up here last Sunday morning, I, I, I knew that God confirmed to me what I was supposed to do this weekend. We got people around us on a day-to-day -day basis that are so broken that they don't want to breathe anymore here on this earth. We've got people who are grieving over losing someone and they can't get past it we got people who have demons who have plagued them for most all their lives and they can't seem to get away from them and they just want to end it and this brokenness is breaking my heart and I think it should all of ours We've been, we've been learning about God's grace on Wednesday night. And in our class back there, we, we have been, I've, I've told this story. Some of you in here may have heard it before. But I felt like the first thing I was supposed to do this morning, you know, I heard Billy Graham say one time, that you can tell a lot of people about Moses, Joseph, all these heroic people of our faith. But if you really want to, if you really want to get to someone and really tell the story of what Jesus can do, tell them what Jesus did for you. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of my testimony this morning, just to, just to start off. I, w I was raised up in church. My, my mom and dad made sure that I was in church. And I just, as I got older, I really didn't care about it. I really, I was there, but I wasn't there. And I relied more on people around me than I ever searched out for a relationship with God. My mom was, was me and my dad were best friends, and he was an awesome dad. My mom, she was my go-to. She was, she was just strong no matter what. Anything that you had going on in your life, you could go to her, and she could make it seem okay in just a little bit. I mean, it was just a special gift that she had. And when my life broke is when I lost my mom, when she went on to heaven. And I didn't know what to do. The, the crutch that I had was gone. And I sp started spiraling, and I went to a really, really dark place. I was on the road traveling by myself all the time then, and I was, I was drunk all the time. I was not a good husband. I was not a good dad. Addie was small. And uh, 
in a hotel room by myself in St. Louis, Missouri one night. <clears throat> I'm a chicken is the only reason that I'm still here. Because if I could have figured out any way to have killed myself in that hotel room that night without suffering any at all, I would have done it. That's where I was. I, I didn't see any way out of the hole that I was in. I didn't know what to do. But I knew all, in my heart I knew I had, to get, I had to get back home. I had to get off the road by myself and I had to get back home. And about a week later, a guy called me and he knew I used to be a person agent in a mobile home business and he offered me a job and I took a $50,000 a year pay cut and came off the road and went and took that job. And when I got home, I don't know, I don't know about y'all, but when you know that you need to come off the road and the next week you have an opportunity to come off the road, <laughs> I, did, I knew something special was happening in my life to give me a chance. And when I come home, I didn't really know what to do because we wasn't going to church at the time, but I started reading my Bible. And I started praying. And I felt so bad over the way I had been living my life that I couldn't get past it. From the time I got up in the morning to the time I went to bed at night, I was crying and praying on and off all day long. I cried all the way to work and prayed. I cried all day at work and prayed. I cried on the way home and prayed. I, cr I cried when I got home and I prayed. And we decided to go to a church and we ended up joining that church. And... Uh, I've been praying, God, just give me, show me, do something to point me in the right direction. And a guy at that church came up and asked me about if I'd be a part of a disciple group. And I said, I don't even have to pray about this. I've already been praying about it. And so I was in. And not long after I, after I started in that group, I, I realized what I had been missing my whole life. I, I, I had gotten parts of it before. I knew a lot of information about it, but I never had truly, really gotten what Jesus did for me by dying for me and saving me from my sin. I never never really really grasped it and I still don't really grasp it I, I don't think you can really grasp how deep and how wide and how tall God's love is for all of us so the worst thing that could possibly happen to me next happened I started getting religious I started actually feeling like I had my stuff together just a little. And I started looking down on other people that didn't look like they had their stuff together. And we were asked, me and my wife, we were asked to be youth directors. And we prayed about it. And that was what we felt like we were supposed to do. And about three months after I, after I, after, after we took that, I went into the deepest depression you have ever seen anybody go into, and I had no clue what, what was going on. It was out of the blue. I would come home every day and just lay there and cry, and I couldn't even tell you what I was crying about. I, I was just depressed, I, and I could not get over it. I could not get past it and they was running I told I told faith I said you just don't be one way one day and then wake up the next and be a different way and something not be going on I don't know what's going on and so I started going to the doctor and they started running tests on me and they and they figured out that my testosterone had bottomed out at 
30 something years old. I don't even know how, how old I was at the time, but in the middle of that, in them trying to get me, my levels back straight, I about went crazy. It, nothing was happening fast. <laughs> it, was, it was very slow. And I, I remember one morning I got in the shower, and I can't explain to you what I felt when I, when I, when I was in there, but I had a straight razor up on the edge of my shower, and, and something evil around me was telling me to, to cut my, just go ahead and cut your wrist. And the only thing I can explain to you is that God said, get out. And I got out of the shower before I'd ever even washed because I knew if I stayed in there that whatever that was was going to talk me into it. And I had heard a praise song the day before and I didn't really get to listen to it, but the end of that song said, fear and depression, you have to bow. All these things that demand my attention, you have to bow to Jesus. And I was on my way to work, and I had just about gotten to CJ's store on, on uh, 24 in Belgrade. And I, there's, there's crying, and then there's crying. It, with everything inside of me, with every bit of effort, energy inside of me, I was crying, and I was singing that song as loud as I possibly could. And all of a sudden, my whole body went numb. And I got scared. I didn't know what, what, what had just happened. And I, 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 I've heard of a stroke. never heard of a full body stroke before. I didn't know. So I said, well, there's this somebody at work I can ask. So when I got to work, I said, what do you? I told them about what just happened. They, they said, you know what Jesus would have done if he'd have been in the truck with you and saw you in that condition? He would have hugged you. And he would have told you that everything was going to be all right. And he said, what you got this morning was a Holy Spirit hug. And I even tried to worry about the stuff that I was worrying about before on purpose, and I couldn't go back there. For that day. That morning, I could not go. I could not worry about the things that I was worried about before. And it was just a <clears throat> there for a while. It was just a claw. Like I just, it was just everything I I could muster up just to get up and get a shower and go to work in the morning. I was so depressed and so down. It was taking everything out of me just to go to work. And we had the youth, and we had three classes to teach, three classes to get ready for. You got work, you got stuff going on at home, you got kids to take care of. My dad's sick with cancer. <clears throat> and everything inside of me, a lot of times was telling me just give up. Everything. And that Holy Spirit, every single time, would say, just one more step. Just one more step. Just move forward one more step. And my dad got worse. And the doctor calls me and says, you need to call your sisters and tell them that he's probably not going to make it through the week. And... I was sitting there reading my Bible one night and I read this verse that said if there's any sick among you call together the elders of the church and pray anointing them with oil <laughs> and I told my dad I said why hadn't we been doing this he said I don't know so you know what we did that week we prayed over him, anointed him with oil, and he lived for a whole nother year after that. And so people have started asking me to come fill in 
different different places and I mean I wasn't getting a ton of calls but once every two or three months somebody called me and asked me if I could fill in at the church or whatever and so I got a, I got a opportunity to fill in at this church one Sunday morning and when I called our pastor at the time to tell him <clears throat> he got mad because it was not the same denomination that we were and I, 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 I just I said well I believe I'm given the opportunity to go tell the truth and anyway we we had got to a point where we just said me and me and faith said you know it's time for us just to just to move on and go visit other churches it's and so I had been told about a couple things so I I, I I called the pastor to tell him we were going to go visit other churches and he, he said well, I, I thought the least that you and faith could do as good as this church has been to you is stay for another month and I said well I, I don't really want to hear as good as this church has been to him I hadn't ever asked him about here for anything I, I mean this is what we've decided to do and I'm not staying for another month and I said, we've been here for nine years, and we've been serving and doing our very best. And he said, oh, you've been doing your best? Well, what about that one Sunday morning you was late for Sunday school, and the youth was already up in the youth center? Was you doing your best that Sunday? <clears throat> and I can't tell you how bad that crushed me. And this is hard to get up here and talk about, but I don't know what, no other way to tell you where God's got me where I am today without saying it. I, when, I, when, I, when I got past that phone call, My question to myself was, how in the heck can you ever live up to the standards these people put on people? Can't do it. I can't. To be honest with you, I still battle the things that I was telling you at the beginning of this story. I got a tie on. I got some khaki pants on. One of the two pair I own. I got some boots on. They look nice. I still battle wanting a drink. <sighs> I still battle wanting to use unchristian words when I lose my temper because I want somebody else to, to do something that they didn't really want to do. I took Addie to practice pitching the other night because she's been, you know, in a weird place where they're pitching, we was going to try to work through it. And I told her to get her head out of her tail in not such a nice way the other night. <laughs> I'm, I lose my mind in traffic. Faith told me the other day, you know, you, you could really be classified as psycho when you're behind this wheel in traffic. I'm broken. Amen. But if we're going to be honest, we all are. We're all broken. And even though your battle may be different than mine, it's a battle nonetheless, and you're broken nonetheless. The question still remains how can I live up to the impossible standards that church people will put on people today this is when God really started showing me his grace God started showing me who he really is Jesus started saying that's not who I am. Who you have in your head 
And what I'm going to do to you if you mess up is not who I am. This is who I am. And I, and I, I started to see it. And Jesus was showing me. Everybody that Jesus came to and everybody that gave Jesus their ear, every one of them was in the same boat that I was in right there at that moment. And still where I am today. <clears throat> he, he, he was going up to people who had all these rules put on them for years and years and years. And they finally got to a point where they said, you know what? I can't do this. And they didn't just think it. They said it. And the religious people looked down on them because they just wouldn't act like they could keep on doing it. Just because they were honest with themselves and said, we're failing at this, the religious people hated them. And they didn't just hate them, they cast them off. Would not have one thing to do with them. Hated everything about them. And Jesus comes and he says to the religious people, you worship me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Your worship is a fake. What you're doing every Sunday is a fake. If you think you're better than all these people, your worship is a fake. You don't see yourself as you truly are if you think you're better than all these people. You put all these rules and regulations on all these people and you call them commands of God. Everywhere Jesus went, he set up camp with the broken. And it ticked these religious people off. Every time you see Jesus come up to someone who's broken, the biggest screw-up you've ever seen in your life, every single time Jesus welcomes them with open arms and his harshest words are for the religious pretenders that are around throwing judgment on everyone. Every time. Jesus said you crush people. You religious people, you crush people with these religious rules. You crush them and you don't lift a finger to help them. You don't care about them. And that's why Jesus kept on talking about love because that was the main problem. You see, when you don't see yourself as who you really are, then you don't see your need for God's love. And when you don't receive God's love because you don't see your need for it, then it's hard for you to love other people. And so Jesus is saying, love God and love people. That sums all of it up. Jesus looked out. And I can just see Jesus standing on the side of this hill looking out into this valley. And these droves of people, thousands, coming and settled in this valley waiting for Jesus. Because they were so broken. They didn't know what else to do. They had nowhere to turn except for to this man. They had heard things about him. They knew what he had been teaching. They heard about his miracles. And they knew that if they could get to him, they would find the answer that they needed. And Jesus stands there and it says he looked on these people with compassion. Because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. The people that were supposed to be helping them, the people that were supposed to be leading them, had left them. Why? Because they couldn't keep the rules and they wouldn't, they wouldn't just go on acting like they could. They wouldn't get religious. Because it was empty. Jesus told them, come to me. He said, these people have let you down. These people that you were supposed to be able to depend on have let you down. Come to me. All of you who are weary and heavy with burden that they have put on you. And then take my yoke upon you and learn from me. And here's the main difference between me and them. I'm gentle and I'm humble at heart. 
I have every right to think I'm better than you, but I don't. And he said, you will find rest for your soul right here with me. All this worry, all this trying to keep up with all the working, all this is done when you come right here at my feet. Over and over, Jesus and the broken are drawn together like magnets. And everybody who believes with everything inside themselves that they're doing things right, missing over and over. Religion will kill you. Religion will leave you without the only thing that will save you. Religion will always tell you, this is what you can do for God. And a relationship with Jesus Christ will always tell you, this is what God did for you. When you were in the pit and could not help yourself, this is what God did for you. When you couldn't keep the law, when you couldn't keep these rules, Jesus came and kept them for you. When you couldn't do anything to save yourself from your sin, the sinless one came and saved you from your sin. When you couldn't get out of death, he escaped death and walked out of the tomb. Right. Everything that you need is in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And everything about religion and works is dead. Amen. It'll kill you. Best thing Jesus ever did for me was break me. In the middle of that time, it was so terrible. And I wasn't saying it then. I was saying, God, how's this good? You say you're good. How is this good? But the best thing he ever did was broke me. Because it showed me how worthless these things were that people were using to sum up what I was worth. And he showed me that I couldn't do it. I, I tell you what, we'll do, we'll do a study this week. Everybody get up in the morning and write down 10 ways to make yourself better. And try it for four weeks and then call me and tell me how it's going. Because you'll be worse then than you are right now. I've done it. What he, what he showed me in my breaking point was that I not, I not only had to rely on him for my salvation. I, I not only had to rely on him for saving me from my sin, but every day after it, one step at a time, I can't do one thing without him. He showed me that. And I never would have saw it if I had not been broken. We want to be in comfortable positions. We want to stay where we're comfortable. But we never learn anything worth anything unless we're in the mess and the muck. We never learn anything worth anything in the comfortable spot. Two stories kept on coming to my mind this week. And I told Chris, I've had this title for six weeks. And that's about all I've had. I didn't know what to do. So, the first story that kept on coming to my mind is a woman caught in adultery. I just, I just love how Jesus is the only one that could that could just he could have stepped down and wiped out every sinner on earth and would have had every right to and he didn't and these people bring this woman into town and throw her down at Jesus feet and they say she's been caught in an act of adultery law of Moses says we stone such a woman But, you know, there also had to be two witnesses. 
So how long did they creep through the window trying to find out this was going on and catch them? And then I started thinking, well, where's the guy? Because it takes two. Here's what I think happened. I think that they had a guy that they said, we won't bring you in, but we're going to use you to get this woman caught because we need her to trip up Jesus the Messiah is what they were saying. And that's what they did. They, it was a setup. She, she she was the bait. And it ruined her life. Ruined her name. But she was dispensable. Didn't matter if it ruined her name. Every time she goes into the market from here on out, everybody's going to be looking at her, talking about her. Didn't matter. She She was just a pawn in their game. To trip up the Nazarene. And they throw her down at Jesus' feet. And he just stoops down and starts writing in the sand. And there, this woman is, is scared to even look up because she knows she's not going to be met with kindness. And all she can see is these fingertips grasping this rock so hard that they've turned white. And Jesus says, whoever has no sin can cast the first stone at her. And the older guys knew how big of a screw up they were. They was the first ones to drop their rocks. The younger guys was a little bit more cocky. It took them a little bit longer to think of something they would consider as bad, and then they dropped their rock. And she is face down on her knees on the ground tears streaming down her face and Jesus the one that could condemn her the one that could pass judgment on her he said woman where are your accusers are they not here to accuse you are they not here to declare you guilty she said no and Jesus said neither do I declare you guilty now go and quit sleeping around because it's tearing your life apart Jesus was upset about the sin because someone who's perfect can't be okay with it but he was he was more torn up about how it was affecting her life because he she was the one that he really loved that's where his love was pointed towards was the woman And then I, the, the woman who washed Jesus' feet, these two women, I could not get them out of my head. And Jesus goes to eat at the Pharisee's house. And they're sitting there, and this woman comes in, uninvited, unannounced, and she, because Jesus is reclined back with his feet behind, behind him over on one side is what is the way I'm picturing it his feet are kind of curled up behind him and this woman comes up behind him and she starts crying and her tears are just soaking his feet and she takes her hair and she starts wiping the tears off of Jesus feet and then she takes perfume oil and starts putting on her on his feet. And the Pharisee in the house, whose house that he was, Jesus was at eating, didn't say it. He thought it. If this, if this man was really who he says he is, he would know how filthy this woman is who is touching him right now, and he would not let her touch him. And that thought was all it took. And Jesus stood up and said, let me tell you something. 
I came into your house and you did not offer me the customary washing of my feet when I came in your door. And she didn't have any water, but she washed my feet with her tears. And you did not wipe my feet off. And she did not have a rag, but she used her own hair. And you did not offer me the customary anointing my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume oil since I got here and kissed my feet. And he said, let me, let me ask you. They, they was two men who had borrowed money from this guy. One of them 500 and the other 50. And when they neither one could repay him, he said, your debt has been forgiven. Now, which one do you think was the most thankful for being forgiven for that debt? And he said, I suppose the one that had the greater debt. And he said, you're right. You're right. The one who had the greater debt. He made the Pharisee admit it. The one who had the greater debt. Her sins, which are many, have been forgiven. So she loves me a whole lot. You don't think you're doing anything wrong, so you don't know anything about love. People may say, well, you know, these women, it's like they always say about Paul. They, they, people say, well, these women, I mean, they was doing that stuff before they became a follower of Christ. Followers of Christ don't do stuff like that. Right? What about David? What would we do to a deacon here today that cheated on his wife with another woman, got her pregnant, and then had the man killed by a hitman in order to hide it all? What, what, what would we do? We'd say, tell you what, it's hard for me to believe a Christian never do that. I don't know if he's really saved or not. The Bible says David's a man after God's own heart. And this is why. David was a God seeker. He was a screw up, but he was a God seeker. And he never made an excuse for his mess ups. He always owned up. When he took that census and, and the whole nation was dying right in front of his eyes, he said, God, don't punish all these people for what I did. Put it on me. He knew who he was and he knew who God was. And he knew the only thing that he had worth anything was God. And that never changed no matter how bad he messed up. What about Peter? He was in till he wasn't, right? I mean, he was in till that crowd grew that come to get Jesus. And the first thing he saw was a right hook pummel Jesus head over feet. And he's like, see y'all. Well, you're one of them. We seen you with Jesus. Nope, I don't know him. Yeah, we saw you. Uh-uh. Wasn't me. May have been a guy that looked like me, but it wasn't me because I don't know Jesus. It was you. I saw you. Last time he cursed, just put a little bit more emphasis on it, right? Dead gum and I don't know him. I don't want anybody else to ask me about it. I have a temper, so I can kind of see where he was coming from there. I, that's probably exactly what he said there. Yeah. And Peter said, the heck with this, I'm going back fishing. God will never use me again. Jesus will never use me 
He'll never want anything to do with me again, just like we do. Curled up in the corner in the fetal position when we mess up, thinking God ain't going to use us. God's done with us. And he said, no, Peter. He come out there where he was fishing at. And he said, throw a net on the other side. And they threw the net on the other side. And the same thing happened as when he first saw Jesus, first met him. And Peter knew who it was. And he jumped off that boat and he swam all the way to the shore. And Jesus did not scold him. He said, do you love me? Do you love me? Feed my sheep. What he's saying is, if, if you really love me, then you won't just run. You'll come back. If you really love me, when you screw up, you come back. People don't know Jesus don't come back. They can sit here and act for a little bit, but when they screw up, they go. And they stay in the dark because they don't know the light. What about Paul? Paul said, I don't even know who I am. Who am I? I know what I should do. I won't. I wake up every morning. Tyler James wakes up every morning wanting to do what's right. <laughs> now, the end of the day is a different story. Paul was the same way. Man penned most of the, whole, most of the New Testament. If he's, if, he's, if he's messing up, I probably ain't going to go without messing up. To the guy that the demons even know. <laughs> when, when the guy that wasn't even a Christ follower started trying to cast out demons, the demons said, well, we know Jesus. We know Paul. Who are you? Paul said, I want to do what's right. I want to do what's right, but I don't. And I don't want to do what's wrong, but I do it anyway. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of sin? None other than Jesus Christ our Lord. He is the only salvation for the eternal condemnation that comes along with your sin and the battle you face with it every day. Me too, all of us, we're in the same boat. And everybody says, they, everybody has an idea of what Paul's thorn in the flesh was. I believe every waking moment he saw Stephen's face. I believe every follower of Christ that he tortured up to the point of the road of Damascus where Jesus came to him, I believe those people those thoughts of those people haunted his mind. Just like our failures haunt our mind and make it where we can't move forward. And I think it was like that for Paul. Paul says, I don't even feel like I can get up here and teach these people anything. Take this away from me. That's the way I felt getting up here this morning. God, I can't do this. You know how... Do you know how big of a failure I am? God said, yeah, I know. I know better than anybody. Paul said, take it from me. Take it from me. Take it from me. And Jesus said, my grace is sufficient for you. I'm using that to keep you right where I want you. Because you're so smart and you, you, you have learned so much. And you walk so closely with me, you'd get puffed up if I did not keep you right there. I ain't got a whole lot to be puffed up about. So I don't know what my reason is for having to live right there, but whoever's got a song. My grace 
is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. Is That right there is the key. Could it be that the woman that was washing his feet had found the real answer? Could it be that loving God because he first loved us is the real way to get this a little bit better while we're here? Is it that we see the grace where he took what we deserved and gave us what we did not? When we see it, and we see what we have freedom from, and we see the love of God encircle around us, and living in that spot, is that how we get better? Just a little bit better while we're here? Every time I seek God, every time I focus on His love for me, I get just a little bit better. I didn't, I didn't wake up and read a self-help book. I didn't go by a list of rules that somebody told me to go by. Somebody didn't tell me the amount of scripture to read every day. I, I read what God put on my heart. I followed what he told me through his Holy Spirit, through the Bible. I prayed when I needed to pray. When God put it on my heart to speak to him and talk to him, I did it. And I did everything because me and him were in communication with each other and I got just a little bit better. And I didn't even realize it. I didn't even realize I was getting just a little bit better. But faith to say, well, you, you handled that a whole lot better. You didn't talk ugly to that guy at the red light like you did last week. You, you got it. But I didn't realize I was getting better because you know why? If I'd realized I was getting a little bit better, I'd got puffed up about it and started making, uh, trying to make all you better like I got better. Could it be that the woman at Jesus' feet had the real answer? To love God because of His immense treasure that He has given to us? The Holy Spirit that we have living with inside of us that is one of the most beautiful scriptures I've ever read is that that Holy Spirit that speaks to you and guides you and directs you and me every single day is a down payment, a guarantee that God's going to follow through on everything that he's promised. How amazing is it? We sing about God's grace. We sung Amazing Grace this morning. How amazing is it to us? If you're broken, which you are, and you know it, then you'll see how amazing it is. Because you'll know, when I leave here on Sunday morning after Daryl or Chris has preached, it takes me an hour to get over it because I sit there and think, I ain't measuring up to it. I'm falling short of everything that he, that he laid out here today. Could it be that if we realized we couldn't do it ourselves, that we believe when Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you abide in me and I abide in you, you'll bring forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If we believe that, and we relied on the only one that can do it, if we believed it when Jesus said, you all can't do the works of God. The only work of God you can do is believe on the one he sent. If we believed it, would it change the way we are? Would it change the way we minister to people? Would it change the way we treat people and love people? Could it be that if we quit putting our faith in pretending that we have the ability to do it, and love God because he first loved us. That we see God do something more amazing here than what we've already seen thus far. Jesus is the answer for the saved person and the lost person alike. You come as 
God directs you. Just when all hope seemed lost, love opened the door for us. He said, Come to the table, come join the sinners who have been redeemed. Take your place beside the Savior. Sit down. Come to the table Come meet this motley crew of misfits These liars and these thieves There's no one who 